welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to return to the Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. Specifically, I'm going to look at connecting input hardware to the Pico, switches and a potentiometer, and I'm also going to cover servo control. So, let's go and get started. Right, here we are back with the Raspberry Pi Pico connected to a Raspberry Pi 400 which we're going to use to write MicroPython code. This said you can use a Windows PC, a Mac or any Linux computer as the Pico's programming hardware. As we can see, the Pico is sequencing five LEDs, which is where we left things at the end of the last video. Last time, however, I forgot to include a circuit diagram, so let's now have one to make it clear how the LEDs and their 220 ohm current limiting resistors are wired to five of the Pico's general purpose input-output pins. And just in case you don't know, here on a breadboard, the pins in the middle of the board are connected in two blocks horizontally, while the outer pins are linked vertically, with one of these here providing a ground rail. If we go across to the Pi 400 desktop, I'll run up Sony under programming here, the Sony Python Integrated Development Environment, where down the bottom right we can see it's got MicroPython Raspberry Pi Pico as its interpreter, so it's connected to the Pico, but it says device is busy or does not respond. And this is because the LED sequencing program is running on the Pico because we saved it on the Pico as main.py, which makes it auto start as soon as the Pico is powered. But as it says here, we can stop that code by just pressing a control C. There we are. And I think I'll just load in that code to remind you what's going on here. If we go to uh, open, we'll open from the Pico. There's main.py, which was running when the Pico powered up. And you can see here that we basically import a library called pin, which is going to allow us to use the pins on the Pico, a library called uTime, which allows us to use time functions with the onboard real-time clock. And here I set up five pins to use as outputs to control our LEDs. And then after that, we set a variable called delay to be 0.25. And then we have an infinite loop while true is always true. And basically in that loop, it turns on LED A, sets the output to high, waits for a delay time for sleeping, turns it to low, moves on to the next LED, turns it high, another delay, moves on to the third one, etc., all the way down. And this does work, but as I said last time, it's not the most brilliant type of code. So what I've done here is to write a better version of that code. So I thought I'd show you that. I've also got it stored on the Pico. It's called a running LED better. There we are. Let's open that one up. And here, let's just have a bit more space on our screen. Same imports at the start. I set our pins up as I did previously. I've called them here L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, just to make it easier in terms of typing rather than LED, A, A, B, B, etc. And then I set up a list using parentheses, the square brackets here, put the values inside the list for all the LED names, L1 to L5 with commas between, still set up delay, but then all we need is this. We simply have inside a while true loop for X in LEDs, our list up here, and it'll put X dot high starting with L dot one, do the delay, go down to low, etc. So this code here is much more efficient than uh, this code here, but they both do exactly the same thing. But uh, we'll just prove that, we'll run this code, and hopefully, yes, there we are, it's now sequencing the LEDs. So I think now we've got ourselves reorientated with the Pico and what was going on, and we'll now move on to look at connecting some input devices. Greetings. Here I am back again with a momentary push switch and a 47K potentiometer, to which, as you can see, I've soldered some jumper leads. And whilst the switch is brand new, I've just bought the switch, the potentiometer is one I took out of an old radio when I was 12, so this is well over 40 years old. Anyway, let's start with the push switch, which by the magic of filmmaking, I've connected to the Pico. And if we look to the circuit diagram, we can see that one lead is connected to pin 36, which is the Pico's 3.3 volt output, and the other lead to pin 1, which is GP, or general purpose input output 0. And this is a good moment to point out that in our code, all references are to GP numbers, not to physical pin numbers. Talking of code, here in Thony, I've got a couple of programs to test out the switch. 
the first of which is very simple. It just loads in libraries as before, and then it defines switch to use pin zero as an input and also to have a pull down resistor. And this last part is very important. And if we look to this graphic, we can see what is going on with the pull down resistor tying our input pin to the ground rail. This stops it from floating around with the pin being maintained at a logical level of zero or zero volts when the switch is not pressed and rising to a logical level of one or 3.3 volts when it is pressed. Returning to our code, we've got a while true loop just to cycle on forever. Where, as you can see, we're going to print the switch value using that code there with a small delay to keep things going satisfactorily. So if we run this code like that, we can hopefully see there Bring that up, we've got a printout currently of zero. But if I go across and uh, take the switch and press it, it goes to one and to zero and to one and to zero. The lion and the tiger, the zebra and the giraffe. Yes, that works perfectly well indeed. So let's uh, stop that code and go across to the second piece of code, which as you can guess is what we had previously, our running light, but with the switch included. So exactly the same setup we've now defined switch as we just did and inside a while true loop we've got another while loop which is while switch value remember switch value will be one or zero when it's one it'll run the cycle so if we just uh, execute this code like that go across to our device nothing's going on is it but if i press the switch oh look it fires an led across this is like one of those games we used to make with leds and bits of electronics when i was very young we used to go very exciting indeed. Anyway, we've proved the principle. We've actually incorporated a switch into our Pico setup here and code. Right, I've now removed the switch and wired in the potentiometer with its outer pins connected to 3.3 volts and ground and this allows it to act as an adjustable voltage divider that will deliver somewhere between 0 and 3.3 volts to GP28 on the Pico, depending on the potentiometer's rotation. Note that while you can connect switches and LEDs to any of the Pico's 28 GP pins, a potentiometer delivers an analog voltage input and hence has to be wired to one of the Pico's analog to digital converters, or ADCs. These are available on GP26, 27 and 28, and here we're using GP28, which can be configured as ADC2. So let's go across to Sony, where once again I've written some test code. And in our first very simple test, we initially have to import ADC as well as pin from the machine library, and then we define pot to be ADC on pin 28. Then we have a while true loop, and inside this loop, we're going to print the value of pot using a pot.read underscore u16, where u16 will convert an input of 0 to 3.3 volts to an integer of between 0 and 65535. So let's run this code, and uh, we see a range of values appear down here. And if I go in and technically twiddle the pot, you'll see it goes uh, different directions. We can take it down to uh, not quite zero, but pretty close. We go the other direction, all the way up to uh, 65535. So you can see the principle there. We're reading a value from the, the position of the potentiometer. So let's uh, stop that piece of code and go across to the second example, which as I'm sure you've guessed is based on a running LED once again, this time adjusted to uh, include the potentiometer. We've imported the right library there. We've defined pot down here as we just did. And then inside the loop, which sequences the LEDs, we've got a delay, not based on a fixed value for a utime.sleep, but based upon the pot read u16 and divided by 32768, which will scale the value there to between 0 and 2 to give us a sleep period of between 0 and 2 seconds. So let's run this code. And uh, initially the LED is hardly moving. It is moving, but not very much, is it? There we are. We can speed it up there if I just twiddle the potentiometer. Hopefully I'm going the right direction. Oh, it's getting faster, look. That's definitely faster. If I keep twiddling, oh, it's ridiculously fast. It's almost just flickering. There we are, bring it back to a more sensible rate. But as you can see, we've proved a principle. 
Weaver managed to wire a potentiometer into the Pico, use some code to read a value from it, and done something with that value. Right, let's now get the Pico to control a servo. And to try this out, here I've got an SG90, which is the most common small servo in the world. And like all servos, it's got three wires, with the red one accepting a supply voltage of between 4.8 and 6 volts, and the brown wire being the ground rail. The orange wire is then used to supply a control signal, which needs to be a pulse width modulation, or PWM, square wave. Like most analog servos, the SG90 accepts a 50 Hz square wave, and the angle of the servo's actuator arm is controlled by the length of the pulse, or duty cycle. The range of duty cycle control values varies between servos, but for an SG90 is about 2% for a servo angle of 0 degrees, and about 12.5% for an angle of 180 degrees. So, let's get the SG90 hooked up to the Pico, and here we are. As you can see, I've got rid of everything else. We're starting from scratch here with the servo. And if we look to a circuit diagram, you can see we're going to control the servo with GP0. And we also have it connected to a ground pin and the Pico's 5 volt rail. Note that it's often wise to power a servo independently with a separate battery or power pack. But for a test using one small servo, making use of the 5 volt rail on the Pico is fine. Once again, I've written some test code, where initially we're importing PWM as well as pin from machine, as well as importing the library uTime, and then we're defining servo to use PWM on a GP0. And then after that, we're setting our servo frequency to be 50 Hz. Next, we're going to control the SG90 by sending it some duty cycle values to move it back and forth between 0 and 180 degrees. As I've noted in the comments I've put here in the code, we're going to use dot duty underscore 16 with a, with a value, and this takes a value of between 0 to 65535 across the duty cycle range of 0 to 100. However, this does not mean that we should send values of between 0 and 65535 to the servo, as, as I've already noted, an SG90 has about a 2% duty cycle for 0 degrees and about 12.5% for 180 degrees. So what we're doing down here in the last bit of code inside our while true loop is to send a value of 1350 to the servo, and then we're going to wait for a couple of seconds, and then we're going to send it a value of 8200. And I've got these exact values using a little bit of trial and error, but my starting points were 2% of 65535, which is 1311, and 12.5% of 65535, which is 8191. So, with all that explained, let's uh, bring up the servo on the screen and run the code. Oh look, the servo's moving. And moving again. Oh, that's working very nicely, isn't it? It's going to a zero degrees, waiting a couple of seconds, 180 degrees, moving back again, and uh, moving back again. Isn't that marvellous? I think we can uh, say with absolute certainty we've established control of the SG90 using the Raspberry Pi Pico. Right, for our final fling, I've brought back the potentiometer and wired it back into the Pico. If we look at the wiring diagram, you can see what I've done, exactly what we've done before, because I thought it might be nice to use a potentiometer and a servo in the same example. So we go across to the test code. You can imagine what's here. We're importing ADC, PWM, and PIN. We've set up the potentiometer. We've set up the servo as previously. And what this code does, as I'm sure you would suspect, is to use the position of the potentiometer to adjust the position of the servo actuator arm. And we know that the output from the potentiometer will be in the range 0 to 65535, so that needs scaling to be in the range 1350 to 8200 to move our servo actuator arm between 0 and 180 degrees. And I make a note of how that's done over, over here in the code, and it's implemented down here in our while true loop. Our final while true loop, where we're going to calculate a value we're going to use as the duty cycle, which is an integer of that range, has to be an integer to pass across to uh, the servo, and then we set the duty cycle of the servo to uh, that value. 
So let's bring up the servo on the screen and uh, run the code. And uh, oh look, the servo moved, it's jittering a bit. But if I take the potentiometer and move it, it's like virtual puppeteering, look, I can, or physical puppeteering. I can move the potentiometer, and as I do so, it moves the servo actuator on. And as I said, this is a bit jittery, and I'm sure this is an issue with using a 40 plus year old potentiometer rather than an issue with the servo. And I can prove that because if I go and stop the code, you will see that the servo stops jittering because it's staying at the last value it was sent. And also if we go down to the code here, maybe let's just put in under there, let's just put in a uh, print value like that. And if we now uh, save the code, oops, and uh, rerun it like that, it'll start jittering again. But if we look on the screen like this, you can see the values which we're sending to the servo, which are not consistent. They are across our scale, should be at 81200, all the way down to, what was it, 1350-ish. It's roughly that, but clearly the problem is the, the age of this potentiometer is giving us problems in terms of the, the quality of its output. But uh, anyway, it still proves a principle. We managed to uh, link one device to the other in our final example of exciting things you can do with a Raspberry Pi Pico. As you probably gathered, I really like the Raspberry Pi Pico, and I'm sure I'll return to it again in another video on this channel, maybe try a project with it, and I might also look at other microcontrollers as some of you have asked me to do. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.